food technology. Is it Shelby? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, because you're very important, so I don't want to forget your name. Um, so food technology and portion size. This is just looking at childhood obesity. It's gone up double, tr triple, almost quadrupled in just the last uh, 20, 30 years. And uh, we're not the fattest people in the world. There are people, American Samoa, 66% obese. Uh, they're really, really obese. And um, this is women, this is men. And if you look at this, look at the, over here, we've got um, Italy, is it 9.5%. How does Italy, hi, how are you? Good to see your smiling face. Thanks for coming. Um, so Italy at 9.5%, how does Italy stay so skinny when they eat so well? How is, Ben? All the cooks moved to the U.S. <laughs> All the cooks moved to the U.S. is very good. Good point. That might be it. I don't think so. But what else? Why else, Shelby? Why is Italy so... Yeah, how can they stay so thin and eat so well? The Mediterranean diet, maybe? Mediterranean diet might be it. So, who's to blame for this thing? A lot of people say it's the industry giving us these big portions. I think it's more of an individual choice. We're making very poor choices. And the industry's actually tried. McDonald's has come up with this new oatmeal. Have you tried the oatmeal? <gasps> Have you? I think it's great. It's actually a destination food of mine. I go to McDonald's just to eat the stinking oatmeal because it's good and, it, and it's good for me too. So the industry is trying to give some healthy options. Uh, Panera has their half uh, portions and uh, baked chips and then Wendy's has some sides that are actually pretty healthy, a little salad and some fruit. And, and even Subway has come up with a breakfast item that is actually fairly good for you. Same thing with Dunkin' Donuts, an egg white turkey sausage, wake up, whatever it is. So the industry is actually trying to do what's, uh, what's right. So why is it then that people are gaining weight? What's the cause of it? Sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle? Portion control. Portion control. Fast food on every corner. Fast food on every corner. Food is everywhere. What else? Time crunching. Time crunching. Yeah. The, uh, what you're putting into your body, like, people are eating more fatty foods, which causes them to be fat. More fatty foods, that's probably it too. So you've said, this is what you said. You mentioned these things, lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyle, um, stress and pressure, um, advertising, genetics. Now all these things have to do with gaining weight. But my question is, which one of these things changed in the last 20 years with a huge increase in obesity? Um, each one of these things has changed very little in 20 years. They've changed a lot over time, but not a lot recently. Deep emotional needs, Dr. Phil. Do we eat when we're excited? Yeah. Do you eat when you get sad? Okay. So we eat with our emotions. But the thing is, is have our emotions changed that much? I don't think so. And so today, this is the premise for what we're going to talk about today. We lose track of how much we eat, and we eat more. And so my example of losing track of something, we think we understand what to eat, but we don't. And here's a little example of thinking something is true and it isn't. There's a little girl praying, God bless mommy, daddy, grandma, and grandpa. And one day she's praying, God bless mommy, daddy, and grandma, goodbye grandpa. And he said, why did you say it, honey? She said, I don't know. Next day, grandpa dies. She's praying along a few days later, God bless mommy and daddy, goodbye grandma. He said, why'd you say that? She said, I don't know. The next day, Grandma dies. He thinks this little girl has a connection with the divine. A few days later, she's praying, God bless Mommy, goodbye Daddy. He panics. He doesn't go out for lunch, doesn't go out for dinner. Midnight comes, he's alive. He goes home and says, dear, you have no idea how bad my day was. She said, you had a bad day. The mailman died on the porch this morning. <laughs> he thought he was her father, but he wasn't. The mailman was. I, okay. <laughs> and so... And so my point there is that we think we know what we're doing with portions, but we don't. And hopefully in the next 10, 20 minutes, I'll convince you that we're being fooled by portion size. Number one, portions have gotten bigger. And so the original Hershey bar was about this big. It was about 0.6 ounces. And so now they're up to a half of a pound. You can get half pound chocolate bars. And the same thing with burgers and fries. Everything is bigger and we lose track of how much we eat. So the original bagel was about 140 calories, now it's 350. And people talk a lot and say to me, what'd you have for breakfast? And they'll say, I had a bagel. Good. And we think we're doing good, because all we have is a bagel. But it's 350 calories. How many calories in a slice of bread? Like 100. It depends what kind. Yeah. And it's probably <coughs> even less than 100. So if you say it's a little less than 100, how many? Size, like yeah, you can get, so, so maybe 70, 80 calories is an average. How many slices of bread is that? Like five. No, it's six. It could, could be six. My uncle used to eat like a dozen at a time. 
So the point is this. That's a good point. So your uncle would eat six slices of bread. Most people say that's excessive. You know, six if times six. <laughs> really? Oh, jeez. <laughs> I've eaten a whole loaf, but I was younger. So you eat a bagel, and people think we're doing good because we ha all we have is a bagel. But if you looked at that in slices of bread, and someone says, I have five slices of bread, you would catch the idea that you're overeating. But if you have one bagel, you don't catch the idea. And so we're being fooled by portion size. They're bigger. We don't get it. Same thing with the burger. There was the burger about 300 calories. Now they're about 600. We're getting fooled by the size of a burger. One burger. I've what are you choking on there? You think it's too small? It's usually like a thousand. Right. So you're absolutely right. And so here is the Monster Burger. It's 1,420 calories. And so the Monster Burger, then, we get fooled by that too. And so you eat this Monster Burger, and you have with it fries. Do you think you have a small fry with that Monster Burger? No, you have the large one. And so that's 2,000 calories. If you have a large shake, how many calories in the largest shake out there? Like 2,400. <laughs> It could be. I don't understand what could that be. Over 1,000. It's over 1,000 calories. So that's a 3,000 calorie meal. And so here's the being fooled by portion again. You eat this huge burger and these fries, and about six hours later you get hungry again, and you remember you had that big burger, 3,000 calories. And you go, I think I'll skip dessert. But you need to skip dessert. You need to skip dinner. You need to skip breakfast. You need to skip lunch. You need to, you need to skip. You have to skip for quite a while, a week maybe, to make up for that. So the point is, is that we're losing track of how much we eat and we overeat. Even when we have these huge portions, we think we make up for it, but we don't. How many calories do you need per day just to have a concept of how many So and how many calories you need per day for kind of normal Americans might be 2,500. And so this is 3,000 calories in one meal. So you get more than you need in, a, in one meal for your entire day. But if you eat one meal per day and that's it, uh, and if you don't feel hungry, is this good for your body or do you need more? Well, I don't know, but most people, you can't do that because you eat one meal and then you get hungry again. So you have this huge burger and by dinner you don't say, I'm going to skip dinner. You eat dinner. So we get fooled by portion. And um, it's not just fast food, but it's regular restaurants too. It used to be about 500 calories, now they're about 1,000. So they're twice as big. And we're actually doing a study. We just did it last, a couple of weeks ago. We did a little study where we had to-go plates. And so we had gave people a big spaghetti dinner and gave them a to-go plate afterwards and said, eat what you want and then put away the rest. They put away about two ounces. And then we had them take the to-go plate before they got started and said, put away what you want. They put away about 10 ounces and then didn't go back to it. And so the difference between what they put away at the end and what they put away at the beginning was about eight ounces difference, almost another meal. And so this, this idea of having these huge portions that the industry keeps giving us one answer might be, is putting things away ahead of time. Have you ever heard of the bottom, bottomless chili experiment? <laughs> no. <laughs> the bottomless chili bottomless experiment. Chili. So there's two um, groups. The control is someone who just gets a regular bowl of chili and they eat it. Most people will finish it and they're fine. But the other people, their uh, variable in the experiment is what they do is there's like a tube feeding chili. Oh, that's my experiment. I'll give it to you in a minute. So I did that about uh, five years ago. And so we have this never-ending bowl of soup yeah, that we did. So yeah, I'll, I'll give that. That's very good. That's nice you brought that up. I wrote about, about that a while ago. We did it about six years ago, probably. So it's been a while. It's, it might be a little longer than that, actually. Sure. And so value marketing, you get a little bit of extra something for a little bit more money. But is it really a value to get something you did not need in the first place? And this is what we get. This is we get a value meal, you get 600 calories. How many people need an extra 600 calories? And so is it a value to get something you did not need in the first place? My answer is no. What uh, you translate these calories to fat or weight or something because they have potential. If you get more 1,000 calories, how do you... There's about 3,600 calories in a pound. When you, if you... If, so add to your weight, uh, yeah. So if you added a burger and you took an extra 600 calories, that would be, you know, like a fifth of a pound you would gain if you didn't compensate for it. Yes. Like how about exercise? Like how, much, how many calories do you burn running a mile? See, it really depends. It depends how big you are. If, if, it depends if you're male or female. And so if you're, if you're a small woman and you run, a, you run for an hour, you can burn a, a few hundred calories. If you're a huge guy, you can burn a thousand calories. You know, by just going for a, working out hard for an hour, you can just burn it up. 
Depends how big you are. So I'll go run on the treadmill and stuff, and like they're telling me I'm burning like only 100 calories. I'm right. Like, there is no way. I've been sweating for like 10 minutes. <laughs> you burn less than you think you do. A lot of people. No, 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 I know. And the way I know that, <laughs> yeah. they're trying to tell me I'm burning like 10, 20 <laughs> calories in 10 minutes, and I'm going. Oh. And did you put your weight in? No. Did before you started? They don't we'll put see. Your Right. And like my, my heart rate, like it gets like really high when I'm running. <laughs> As it should. It should. I mean, it's fine. Your heart rate will go up. It's like above athletic. Condition. If it goes above 200, you're probably dead. I, so I don't, don't do that. But really? I, yeah, like average working out is like 180. Yeah, 180 is pretty good for you. That's bumping pretty fast. It's athletic conditioning. Yeah, it is. If I, my heart doesn't go that fast anymore. Uh, there was the big gulp, the super gulp, the double gulp. Things are getting bigger. Now we have the extreme gulp. Even at uh, home, not just fast food restaurants, but even at home, things have gotten bigger. You don't know it. And so the thing is, we're being fooled again because it's the same recipe for 60 years, but instead of making 100 cookies now, it only makes 60. Why? Because we demand bigger portions. And so to save your friends and family relationships, you get bigger cookies. And if you don't do that, uh, people will get upset. <laughs> Smaller mouths. I don't know if others will do it. Yes. These bigger portion sizes that you get at restaurants and other fast food, it's almost making you, when you go home and you make your meal, you're going to want to like quantify that as well. Like I think that's probably true too. Thin. So if you're out eating these huge things when you get home, it tends to make you eat more too. That's a good point. You stretch out your stomach. That's true too. Like with all the gastric bypasses that we have now. <laughs> when my, my mom's friend got a gastric bypass and like she used to eat a lot and she would have snacks everywhere, but like now she's you're right and that can be stretched out eventually too so if you really do overdo it you can take that little tiny pouch and you can make it back to its normal size after months yeah. of shoving stuff in there so you have to be careful even with the gastric bypass have you ever seen man versus food yes grosses well, me out every time i see it i like just want to be there with him man versus some of the stuff he puts in his mouth i would never ever put in my Are mouth oh no oh, so the little <laughs> slugs and things so no. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes it looks good. No, bad. I don't like bizarre things. That's, oh, that's fine. Okay. All right, so we did this little video called Portion Size Me, and I, we don't have time to really do the video, so we're going to skip that, but I'm going to show you a little bit of a video um, about the Portion Size Me video. So we put these two kids on a fast food diet for 30 days to see if it could be done, okay. and this is what we came up with. They didn't die. <laughs> no, they didn't. They survived. To put it quite simply, we are a nation of overeaters. But the good news is there's some simple things that all of us can do about it, and early show consumer correspondence is equipment as the tales. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Hannah. Believe it or not, you can eat fast food, chocolate, candy, and cookies, and still shed pounds. You were about to meet a professor who says it all comes down to something very simple, portion control. Pizza, burgers, fries. We think they're the enemy in the battle of the bulge. But maybe not. Yeah, you can eat all those things and lose weight. Nutrition expert Jim Painter says it's not so much what you eat, but how much you eat. He proves it in his documentary, Portion Size. I want you to watch Aaron put this piece of pizza in his mouth. He, was, he would eat 6,000, 5,000 calories a day. He's a machine. Watch this. It's a pizza hut. <laughs> he would eat huge portions. And this was eating fast food every day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they end up losing weight. But getting the right portion size is getting harder. Painter showed us how portions have ballooned. This is a Caesar salad from 20 years ago versus today. Double the portion, double the calories. And same with the pasta and the meatballs. Same with the pasta and meatballs. Now, if you just say, give me the regular serving, it's going to be almost twice as much. And just look at a regular burger and fries from the 50s compared to now. The gentle pain people want this. They don't want yeah. that. They really do. And so one of the problems is, is that we have this idea that more is better. And if you look at people's waistlines, they are more now. <coughs> and it's not better. But is it possible to eat smaller portions and still be satisfied? Painters. So the what we're after here so far is that uh, we're being fooled by portion. Think that's true, Ben? You think we're being fooled by portion? You think you uh, you I catch think it? How much? This is not exercising. <laughs> just eating really, like, bad food. That's true too. We do not exercise. We do eat bad food. 
You don't think we're eating too much food? I, mean, I think you eat until you're full, and then you stop. I, that's how I've always done well, th th You have done well just by looking at you. The rest of the country has not. We're not doing as well as you. So are you convinced at all that portions are bigger and we lose track of things because portions are bigger? Do you think that's true? What we're going to talk about now are five things you can do to help track how much you eat so that you can actually eat less. This is the first little study. I'm going to show it right now instead of later. Um, yes, first point. The third point, he helped us set up an experiment. We invited this group of people to take part in an all-you-can-eat ice cream taste test. Take as much as you want. Um, if you want to come back for seconds, you can come back for seconds. We started by splitting them into two separate groups. Group A was given a big scoop, big bowls, and big spoons. Group B was given a scoop, bowls, and spoons about half the size. As a result, Group A took huge portions and piled on the toppings. Once we weighed each bowl, they chowed down. Everyone in this group ate quickly. Most even came back for seconds. But watch what happened when we brought in Group B, the ones with the smaller bowls. They filled their dishes, but with smaller spoons, it took them more time to get to the bottom, and most quit after only one. Does that guy look familiar? Have you seen the blind side? Michael Moore. So we were in downtown New York City. Wait, that's not actually him, is it? And I think it's him. It was, it, was 19, it was 2006. I got a bunch of acting students from New York City to come over and sit there. And I'm pretty sure that's him. I've never bumped into him again to find out if it is, but I think it is. Now, you must feel sorry for this guy. Look how he has to hold the spoon. He can't even hold the spoon. It's so tiny. He's holding it like this. Michael finished his bowl of ice cream, his little bowl. And I asked him, I said, do you want more? And he goes, no, I'm really fine. I said, really? And he goes, yeah, I'm really fine. I said, are you sure? And he goes, yeah. And then the bowls come out, and he sees that he had a small bowl, and the other people had a big bowl. And he turned to me, and he, and he said, you cheated me, Dr. Painter. No, I didn't. You cheated me. I said, I asked you three times. He said, I want more now. Fine. I gave him more now. Now, why was it he was satisfied with a little bowl until he saw that someone else had a bigger bowl? I think that's right. I agree with that. Yeah. Just to add to what he's saying, like if I make a salad like in a regular bowl, like it'll be a regular salad, I'll make one. I'll maybe refill it if I'm really hungry. But if I get like the big salad bowl for like giving out to other people, I'll just fill that up by myself and eat it all. <laughs> and so you kind of eat what's in front of you. Yeah. If, you if you have a big bowl, you eat a bunch. If you have a small bowl, you eat a little. It's kind of what this lady says. Listen to what this young girl says about this. Does everybody feel like they ate <laughs> Then we revealed the truth of our experiment and the result. <laughs> Even though both groups told us they were completely satisfied, Group A, the one with the bigger bowls and spoons, ate twice as much as Group B. Are you surprised that you guys ate double the bag? Absolutely. And I can definitely see how just the size of the, of the bowls did it. What? Now this young lady kind of explains what both of you did and why it made such a difference. Listen to what she says. I do think your group ate less. Uh, that's because when you see that your bowl's full and then you eat everything in there, you feel right, you have enough, and that's all you need. So point number one is be very careful about the size of the bowl that's in front of you because the bigger the bowl, the more you'll eat. Brian Wansink, one of my good buddies, did this funny experiment that I don't have up here, but he had people go through a line and they filled up their plate and they weighed the plate. And then the wait staff was taking the plate over and said, here's your plate. Ah, 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 you, I am so sorry, I just snotted all over your plate. Would you like another one? They goes, yes, please, I'll have another one. So they went back through the line and the bowls were smaller. And so people then filled up their plate and they brought it out and they ate. And afterwards they said, yeah, we noticed that it was a little bit smaller the second time, so we put more in there. And on every single time they ended up eating less with a smaller plate, even though they thought they were eating more. So the size of the plate makes a real difference in how much you eat. Jim Painter says the lesson is simple. Control your weight by controlling your portion size. What is the appropriate size? I'm beginning to make a, a big calculation. And I tell people, I'm really serious about this. Reach down and grab your side. <laughs> if there's more there between your thumb and your index finger than you want, think small <laughs> and choose small. <laughs> uh, 
have that problem. Hey, so, we're doing that now. <laughs> so you are eating for two. Well, Peter says that choosing small can be as easy as downsizing all your plates, bowls, and glasses. So here's a look at the dinner plate that I normally use at home. It's huge. So I'm downsizing to this plate. Okay. You know, we actually did that in our house. Does it work? Of course it works. Yeah. yeah. It looks like it's, it's all about He has some other great tips. He said, so Susan Copen, I went there one, well, about six months later, and she had lost 40 pounds. And I said, 40 pounds, that's amazing. She said, well, 20 was the baby. Okay, fine. But the 20 pounds after the baby, I lost because I did these five things I'm going to tell you. Point number one is that the size and shape of a container makes a difference, and you need to be careful what you're getting. So the size and shape of a container will determine how much you eat. This is just showing that it doesn't matter whether it's spaghetti, Crisco, or M&Ms. If you have a larger container, you're going to pour more out of it. So you make your portion decision when you're at the grocery store buying the container that the food is in. So even that influences how much you're going to eat. And then Brian did this little study with popcorn. He gave them a big container it's, and they ate 60 grams. He gave them a huge container and they ate 90 grams. Yeah. Have you seen uh, Five Year Yeah, I think so. What is it? it? Okay, like she goes to this college. The donut thing? Yeah, the donut thing. You've seen it. I have seen it. Yeah, so <laughs> basically, it's just she becomes a psychology major and she finally gets a new master's program or whatever. But the whole thing with like all they do is just psychological experiments on like the town, um, like people from the town. Yeah. And they, like, it's basically the same stuff as this. Not all food related, but, like, um, they did one thing where they put a, like, old tray of donuts in there and, be like, and had someone wait. And they would say, we're going to be back in five minutes or ten minutes with a new tray of donuts. And, um, like, it just depended on the person and who would take the old donut and who would take the new, wait for the new one. Well, that's kind of like what this is right here. So the old donut, new donut thing, here is old popcorn. He gave people old popcorn and they ate about 50% less. But you gave them twice as much old nasty popcorn and people ate twice as much. Even though it was stuff that they didn't want to eat, if they had a bigger container, they ended up eating more popcorn. And so size, which line is the biggest one? Well, they're the same size, but we perceive this more than this. And so when Brian gave these tall glasses and short glasses, he told kids to pour in eight ounces worth of juice. And so when you had the tall glass, they ended up filling up and they stopped pouring it about five ounces, thinking they poured almost eight. When they had the short fat glass, they kept pouring, 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 and they ended up pouring almost 10 ounces, thinking that they poured eight. So not only size, but even the shape of a container fools us. A circumference gets them? I don't know. So here's just looking at bartenders. Uh, less experience in the red, more experience in the gray. If you gave them a tall tumbler, they poured it about right. You gave them a short, fat tumbler, and they over poured every time because they didn't perceive they had had as much in there, and so they over poured with the shorter, fatter tumblers. Number three is visibility and convenience. I have uh, a question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what kind of word that they should use, but I use just so much. Is there any part of this psychological thing, any part of it? Because I want to get worth of my money from the company or feel that I can't be something. So is greed part of it? I think it is. And the whole idea of value marketing, we want our money's worth every time we buy stuff. And so you can call that greed, but we want the value for our money. And so that's one reason the big portions work. It was a decision that was made at McDonald's back in the early 1950s. They said, if I want a dress and you buy a dress, and you show someone a prettier dress on the way out, they'll buy two dresses. But if you give someone a big meal, and on the way out you say, here's more food, they'll go on full. Yeah. And so you have to give them more food in the beginning no. to give them, to, to get more money from them. And so, yeah, the whole greed factor, I think, is really part of it. Right. I know. And, and I do that too. Everybody does that. We want to get our money's worth. When you go to Walmart and you go to check out and you're just waiting, like all the stuff there is just, oh, I mean, I'll buy some gum. Right. It's all impulse things that are right there by the counter. 
So that whole idea of impulse buying, when you see it, you'll eat it. How much more food you eat when you see it compared to when you can't see it. We did this little study with candy kisses for three weeks. We put candy kisses on the desk, people ate nine. We moved it from on the desk to in the desk right here, and people ate 30% less. We made it hard to get to. They had to stand up and get it, and they ate 60% less. So if you see it, you will eat it. And then this is the estimation. People kind of guesstimated right along the lines of what actually happened. And then so we did the same thing with healthy foods. We moved them from in the desk drawer to the top. We did it with grapes, did it with chocolate, did it with carrots, did it with pretzels. And every single time, when you made them visible, people ate more. How come they ate so many more carrots? Ever, who doesn't love carrots? <laughs> yeah. No, I'll say I don't. I don't know. Well, this is what I think. How many of you at 4 o'clock in the afternoon say, man, I've been craving a carrot all day? Well, besides you. No one else has ever it's raised their hand. It's just like, I mean, I'll eat a carrot. <laughs> We did the same thing with raisins. We put five boxes in the drawer, five boxes on the desk. If you want people to eat more food, make it visible, and they ate more raisins. If you put more raisins out there, they ate even more. So visibility makes people eat more. And then labeling foods. Do you want to talk about this one? No? No, oh, that's fine. And so we had food where it was red beans and rice and then traditional Cajun red beans and rice. Same food. We just called it something different. And this is what happened. When we had the fancy name, people thought it tasted much better. And this, this is the same group of people, same customers, same cooks, same students preparing it, same students serving it. The only thing different is the tag on the food. And it, you said, this is red beans. This is traditional Cajun red beans and rice. Oh, it's so much better. And then not only did it taste better, but the texture was better and people thought it had more calories. It made more of a difference with main dishes than desserts because if it's chocolate, it's chocolate. But when we had fish with no label, people went, oh, this is nasty fish, I hate it. And then we had succulent Italian seafood filet. People would say, succulent? Why didn't you tell me? I love succulent. And Italian's my favorite food. This succulent Italian seafood filet is delicious compared to that nasty fish we had last week. And it's the exact same fish. And so we are we are swayed very easily by what something is called. And then number five, here gets to what you were talking about earlier. Um, this is the ice cream study we did with big bowls and small bowls. It's just the original study before we did it on TV. And then we did this soup bowl study. This is what you were talking about. So we set up a table. This table is about like this. We had four bowls of soup on the table. We had a big pot. You could take more from the pot if you wanted to. Nobody ever did. We recorded what people ate. And when we were done, we lifted up the skirt of the table and we showed them that these two bowls were being fed with a tube under the table. So when they ate, it filled back up. And they ate, it filled back up. So one of the guys in the study, some kid sat down, he ate so fast, he got all the way down to the bottom of the bowl. And he could see where it was filling. He kept moving his spoon back and forth. <laughs> well, he did. He kept eating and eating and eating. He got so excited because he could see something moving. He jumped up from his table. He came over and he grabbed my arm. He said, Dr. Painter, what? He said, there's something moving in my bowl. He grabs my arm. He pulls me back to the table. By the time we got back, it had filled back up. And I said, just eat what you want. He got done eating. He had eaten four bowls of soup. So when he got done, I lifted up the skirt of the table. Can you imagine his surprise that when I, got, when I showed it to him that he had eaten four bowls of soup and it kept filling? He had to eat the entire pot to be able to, to finish. And so what this shows you is when they lost the picture of the bottom of the bowl, people ate almost twice as much. We trust in visual cues to tell us how much to eat. We trust in the thing we're eating. If you take that picture away from us and we think we have it, you have no way of deciding how much you eat. And then this is someone across from you is eating four bowls of soup. You're having one bowl of soup. How much do you all have? About the same. If you lose that thing that tells you how much you're eating, you are lost. Um, cup size study. We did this study. You want to talk about this? So this is a cup study that uh, Alex did. Uh, it's not published yet. We're hopefully going to publish this sometime really soon. So, um, We did this to look at the New York initiative where they're trying to decrease the cup sizes that you're allowed to buy in New York City. And so I worked with a group of men and one day I gave them a 16 ounce cup and, with lemonade in it and they're allowed to refill it as much as they wanted. And then the next week I came back and gave them a 32 ounce cup they're allowed to refill it as much as they wanted. And so those with the 32 ounce cup ate almost twice as, drank almost twice as much lemonade as they did with the 16 ounce cup. 
So I was in New York City a couple of months ago, and the mayor of New York City has this ban that was struck down. And so right now it's not even in effect, but they're in a lawsuit. And I said, you know, you used my soup study as one of the reasons why you did this. Would you like some more data? And they said yes. So Alex and some of the other students are doing some research that we're going to send to the uh, health department in New York City. We sat down with uh, Maura Kenny, who is the head of the health department communicable disease section in New York City, and we're going to give them her data when we get the other studies finished. So what's the solution to this? I think the solution is self-monitoring. Um, this is an interesting study that just shows quartiles of consistency. These people didn't write it down, wrote it down better, wrote it down better, wrote it down best. And so when you write down what you eat, you eat less. And so what this shows is the non-holiday week, you wrote it down poorly, you gained weight. You wrote it down a little bit, you lost weight, better. And if you wrote it down really well, you lost a lot of weight. This white is holidays then. You wrote it down during a holiday and you gained weight. Wrote it down better, you still gained weight. Wrote it down better, you still gained weight. If you wrote everything down on a piece of paper and put it in your pocket before you ate it and you tracked it closely, people lost weight even during a holiday if they kept track of what they eat. It's back to my point. We lose track of how much we're eating and we tend to eat more. And so I didn't believe this because I really don't believe anything until I see it more than once. And so I looked and there's lots of studies out there. Here's another study. This is the control group and they said, we're watching you and they started losing weight. And then they forgot people were watching them and they started gaining weight. And then the holiday came and they pigged out and they gained a lot of weight. The holiday ended, they kept pigging out until what point? When do you stop eating after a holiday? When your pants, huh? When the leftovers are gone. <laughs> when the leftovers are gone or when your pants don't fit. And so these people had gained two pounds and went, oh my goodness, I'm a pig, look at this, look how much I've eaten, I better stop. And so you stop eating, but you've already gained two pounds. And then here is the experimental group. They started writing things down, they lost weight. Holiday came, they still lost weight, but not as much. Holiday ended, they still lost weight. And then uh, they quit writing things down and it leveled off. So if you keep track of what you eat, you will eat less, is, is the, the goal here. Meaning, if you ate the Big Mac now or whatever burger, and you added half a pound after a week or two weeks? You know, really, if you, if the guy in Supersize Me, who just supersized every day, he ended up gaining 24 pounds in 30 days. He gained almost a pound a day. That's eating an extra probably 2,500 to 3,000 calories every day. That's extra. And so, can you gain weight fast? Yes. So I'm confused on which side you're on. If, are you on, you're saying you're on self monitoring right? But you would like to have government regulation, or it's not that you don't want to have it, but you're trying to support the initiative for government regulations of cup sizes. Exactly. So, right. so I think that's actually a very good question, because that's the huge battle out there. You know, should we, should we have government control what people can do? Or is it up to people to do what they do? I think it's both. But I fall on the side of personal responsibility because you never can get everything perfect and we must have self-control and personal responsibility. But where do they meet in the middle? When does it become our personal responsibility to worry about the rest of the world? Or is that even a thing? I don't, I don't know. know. So when but is it our, it's, I don't think that that's. No, not I mean, okay. Yeah, when is it our personal responsibility to feed the, or to change the world? It isn't. But I don't see that. But, it, like, but there is the interdependence. Like we can't, as a nation, like we can't like do well if half of the country can't even get off of the couch. <laughs> so which side are you on? I can't tell from what you said either. So I, I'm not I'm either. I'm on self monitor I don't think there should be any. <laughs> But you just said, if half the country can't stand up, then isn't it our responsibility to help that half to stand up? That's not my problem. <laughs> They're going to die on the couch. <laughs> you may be right. And so I think we're probably actually very close in this because I do think it's personal responsibility because you never can get it exactly right. But the end, then on the other hand, there's things like trans fats. You don't know what's in it or not. So if the government can say no trans fat, then I'm eating out. I don't know what's in there. I'm being healthier because of what the government said to do. But I, I do think we can overregulate. But I mean, I'm, I'm all for natural selection. Like, you know, for natural selection? If people want to eat themselves to death, you're all for it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Very good point, I guess. 
that uh, talking about the government, uh, the government sometimes uh, don't force the, uh, the fight, the genetically modified food companies to write that. And also, if somebody dies from this or get any disease, they are they give kind of waiver of any lawsuits or responsibility. Well, they so, just settle outside of court. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's no law. Uh, I mean, the government wouldn't say to the genetically modified companies to uh, <coughs> force them to tell people, here is this. And if somebody gets sick because of eating this, they are not liable. So they got free uh, both ways. So the government comes to me and uh, uh, say, you eat this and don't eat this, but they don't do that. So uh, there should be an overall government and rule in everything or not. Just to be fair. So just anarchy or communism? No, no. I, I'm not. I'm saying if you are going to regulate something, regulate everything. Okay. If you are not going to regulate anything, just get out of it. So how do you balance this? Yeah, so I, I kind of agree with that. That it, things are being regulated in piecemeal, and maybe we're not hitting the right ones to regulate. If we're going to regulate, regulate. If we're not, don't regulate. Is that what you're saying? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, okay. That's that sounds like. Yeah. More of the manufacturer, like when it comes to nutrition and dieting, you don't want to label things as bad foods because then people are going to like want to stay with them <coughs> as far as possible. And when you actually want to partake in something good, you're going to overindulge in it. So almost getting it so you can get the best of both worlds doing it in a moderate portion. I agree with that completely. So the idea that there's good and bad things, there are things that are better for us. Can you have a little bit of something and be perfectly healthy? Yes. People that are vegetarian, can they eat a little bit of meat and be per Yes, perfectly healthy. You know, can you eat a snack or a treat once in a while and be perfectly healthy? Yes. But what happens is that we fool ourselves. You know, there's this guy, he was, he was a thousand, over a thousand pounds. He couldn't even get out of bed. And he's eating chips and he says, it's okay to eat chips as long as you know when to stop. It almost made me want to cry. Because here this guy had fooled himself so much that he was saying something that was true, but he wasn't practicing it at all, and he couldn't even get out of bed, and he, and he weighed 1,000 pounds. So I, I think I agree with all the statements that you've made pretty much. It is a balance on regulation, and this whole idea of 32-ounce cups compared to 16-ounce cu cups, if we have a maximum of 16, what we've shown is, is that people just drink less which is a good thing. If you want two, you can buy two. And people say it's against my civil rights. No, you have a civil right to buy two, if you want. Yes? But, like, then it just goes back to, everyone's buying 32 ounces of soda when we should be drinking water. <laughs> I don't disagree with that either. Instead of buying soda, drink water. So I think that's true. And, and so, that's a, that's a very good little discussion we've had here. Um, this is kind of what we talked about today. Self-monitoring, uh, selecting portion sizes is important for us. Visibility, it's important. What we see, we're going to eat. And if we don't want to eat it, if we don't want to stay out of sight, keep it packed away and you'll eat less of it. If it's more inconvenient, you'll eat less. One of the reasons we eat so much right now is food is so convenient. Someone said that in the beginning, that food is everywhere. And so it's hard to bypass the stuff. And then food labels influence more than we know. There's more influence on what we say about food than what we might be aware of. And even changing the name of something from fish to succulent Italian seafood filet makes people like it a lot more. And then visual cues to satiation. Uh, this could be the most important thing. We trust in little visual cues. If you have a candy bar that's this big, this big, this big, or this big, you eat the whole candy bar, and when you're done, you're done. What told you you were done? It was gone, the size of the candy bar. And so making those decisions ahead of time, choosing the right size, can determine how much you're going to eat. And so visual cues tell us a lot. I think all these things, if we think about them, technology has made food available all the time, and it has made it so easy to get, and so easy to consume, we're over-consuming. And so how are we going to help ourselves to eat less? I think these are the kind of things that we can do to help ourselves eat less. Any other questions? Maybe go back to the portion size. Maybe. Uh, if a pound of uh, meat, certain meat was, just say it is ten pound, uh, ten dollars a pound. Ten dollars a pound, yeah. And uh, if you go to it, they serve you one pound for ten dollars again or something. But if you take two pounds, it will be fifteen. Right. Now, anything that you buy in in a mass, uh, right, is cheaper. Right. So why should a person would just throw their money? 
why don't they get the big one and then take it to the bag or something with them? Just to get the work <coughs> So, So, what were we going to say? I mean, that's exactly what you were saying, though, wasn't it? Right. Like, go, when you go, well, okay, what he's saying is like, if you go to a restaurant and you get all of it, you're more likely to not take a doggy bag just because it's one portion. But if you go to the grocery store and buy like six servings of steak, you're only going to eat one. Whereas you would eat everything that's put in front of you at a restaurant. And so my balance is this. It depends how much money you have. If you have more money than time, then buy the little portions that are pre-packed. And, and that's what you need. If you don't have money, but you have time, then buy the big things and take them home and throw them into little containers and take a big bag of chips, throw it into 12 containers, zip it up so that you've got to open up every single container every time you want one. Yes? Uh, it's kind of contradictory working. Uh, I work at Cracker Barrel. And <laughs> also, I was a nutrition student. But I... Um, for the big meals, they have fancy fixings, and then there's actual dinner sizes, and then they even go down to smaller portions. Right. But for the bigger ones, you get three sides plus an overwhelming portion of like a meat <laughs> choice. That's right. And normally, everybody, like, almost all the customers will eat it all, or right. if they don't, you, and it's normally enough for about three meals. Chicken fillet, two sides of potato casserole, and <laughs> one side of dumplings. And so that's our point. If we can actually show businesses that if they give the to-go box ahead of time, that people will put away two meals. So the person gets two meals for the price of one. The company still gets to serve the huge portion and make their profit. The company wins, the individual wins. And so I gave a talk at Restaurant Leadership. It was the CEOs of all the food companies, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's. They all came up to me after 600 people representing 300,000 restaurants. And so I asked these guys, what can we do to help? And their big thing is, show me how I can make money, and I'll listen to you. Because their big thing is making money. And so I can talk about portion all day long, and they go, yeah, it's nice to hear. We like it, but we need to make money. So if this works, and I can take this to the industry and show them, hopefully we can change the entire world and change the industry by giving to-go containers before you get to started on your meal. Honestly, I think if like all fast food places just like <coughs> revamped their menus like not even like made them healthier just made them smaller and right. made them cheaper not like uh not relatively cheap or not relatively what is it uh proportionally cheaper to yeah. what like the portion sizes were but cheaper enough to where like i mean it's cheap enough to still be fast food and it's smaller meals right and like we don't have that at right. all right unless you get like even when you get salads like the salads at fast food are extremely terrible I agree with most of that. Thank you very much, Wafik. Thank you. Thanks.